go, uh, the last week I never went like zero carbs or anything like that. I would probably, coming up to a contest, I'd probably be on average maybe 400 grams of carbs a day. So the last week I would, uh, I would reduce that by 50%. So I go down to 200 grams of carbs a day. And there's four calories in a gram of carbs, so that means I've gone down to 800 calories and I'm already on a low calorie diet. So what I do, I replace those 800 calories by increasing my protein and fat. I don't really care where it comes from, it's protein and fat, as long as I've replaced those calories. Otherwise, I'm dropping my carbs and I'm dropping my calories further down and you're probably going to really flatten out and lose muscle if you do that. So drop the carbs, but put protein and fat in to keep the calorie level consistent. I would do that for three days, uh, six days out, and then that leaves me three days before the contest to carb up or increase the carbs. And uh, what I used to do was opposite to what most people were doing at the time. Three days out on the first day, I would really load heavily. Um, you know, th this is just for me, so everybody varies. For me, I would take in 1,200, 1,500 grams of carbs on that first day. Um, first of all, you know, I'm already carb depleted. I've been dieting for 12, 13 weeks, and then I'm going through a further three days of even lower carbs, so I'm super depleted. Um, and uh, that way I wasn't afraid to take in too many carbs, because you can carb really heavy, but, uh, especially on the first day, your body's going to be more receptive. It's going to suck the carbs in more on that first day than it is on like three days later. So the first day I'd go real heavy. The second day I would, I would go by the mirror. I'd still probably go quite high. Uh, I was eating just food that I was used to: oatmeal, sweet potato. Uh, I switched over to white rice and I dropped out the uh, the oatmeal as I got nearer because I just didn't want a lot of fiber uh, loads of milk or anything like that. So then I would go white rice. Uh, potatoes and sweet potatoes without the skin, stuff like that, and some bananas. Um, so the first day would be really heavy, the second day would probably be heavy, moderate, I would go by the mirror, and then the third day again I would be going by the mirror, but what I would do is on the, on the evening of the third day I would totally eliminate the carbs. So what I've done, I've carved, I've carved up heavy, and uh, if, if you're worried about spilling over back and retaining water, it's not a problem, because if that happens, you still got the day before the contest. If you drop down to really low carbs or zero carbs, that will just you'll just start having that direct effect and flushing out the excess water. But you're not going to lose the glycogen that's in the muscle because you're not training, you're not using it. So the only thing I would do the last few days is just just posing. Um, so I'll go two days very heavy, the third day uh, moderate heavy in the morning, maybe and taper down to the evening where I'm going on zero carbs. And just have that flushing thing. I would. Uh, I've gone through various things over the years, measuring my water, weighing it, and in the end, all I used to do was just drink a lot of water. Just drink a lot of water until like 20 hours before the competition, and then I was just stuck at bed. So drinking all this water, which you need, the whole point to carb up is to draw water into the muscle. Uh, each gram of carbohydrates in the muscle is 2.7 grams of water. So if you're eating all these carbs and not drinking up enough water, you just, you just feed them all uh, under the exercise. Right? So I drink a lot of water and then the evening before the contest, I would just stop dead with the water. So I'm taking a lot of water, it's either getting stored or my body's flushing it out. So my body's used to flushing out all this water and then when I just stop it dead, I just carried on flushing. And uh, I would have a couple of drinks as well the night before the contest. Some alcohol, some blood <laughs> I don't know if it did anything, but it made me feel good. <laughs> um, seriously, alcohol is a good diuretic. So I would stop drinking water, I have a couple of drinks. Uh, go to bed and in the morning I'd be like dry as a leaf. You know? So that was the basic process. As far as sodium goes, um, I didn't uh, I didn't restrict it until the day before either, because to carb absorb the carbohydrates efficiently, you need some sodium in your diet as well. So I just cut that out like 24 hours before. And if you cut it out too soon, if you restrict your sodium too soon, your body's very clever. You know, if you restricted too long, your body's just going to start retaining it. So, just for a short period of time, I would drop the sodium out. Who was my fiercest competitor? There's, there's different ways to look at that. As far as the fiercest competitor, uh, I don't know, I was probably Sean, but in my mind, Sean would never beat me, on my, even on my worst day, you know? It was, it was never a threat, but Sean was tenacious, you know, Sean was there every year, always in shape, uh, where the other guys were a little bit more inconsistent, but 
potential wise, Flex Wheeler was potentially, I mean, the guys in free, you know. Um, but fortunate for me, he didn't have his head really together, he wasn't uh, consistent, maybe never really achieved his maximum potential. Uh, and, and Kevin was uh, Kevin was very good as well. And uh, but towards the end, I think Kevin, you know, he, he was having long periods off training. Like he wasn't training for six months of the year. He was going to a rock band and playing music and stuff. Uh, but you know, you can't really do that if you want to be the best professional in the world in your sport. I never took any. I took like maybe a week off to go on holiday. And even then, I was looking where is the nearest gym? You know, want to go work out. And uh, people used to ask me, why don't you take time off training? I'm like, because I enjoy it. Why don't you take time off sex? <laughs> <laughs> There's no reason for me to take time off. You know, I like doing it. It's, you know, I still like training. I like the challenge. Uh, even if, you know, even if there was no competitions, I would train. I just like to go to the gym and train. That's it. What methods did you use to monitor your body health? The only, I mean, I use the scales, I use the mirror, uh, I use uh, body fat uh, calipers, but, you know, none of them are like, they're all like a guide, you know, and the combination of everything is, is what I use to guide my progress, and I would, make, I would take notes every week, every year, so I could look back, um, but just because you can get a body fat analysis saying, whatever, 3%, 4%, it doesn't mean anything, it's still like crap. You look in the mirror, or you know, if you're on stage. Um, on as far as the body fat calipers go, I would get down to probably three and a half percent four weeks out, and I would definitely get leaner uh, getting ready to the contest. But the calipers wouldn't register because it's just you know beyond a certain point that they're, they're, they're not accurate. Once you get below five percent, they're probably not really registering. So at that at that point, just the most important thing is how do you look in a mirror. And I always always take pictures as well in the same place with the same lighting and so on to try and judge things. So I've used various uh, various guidelines. How many sites did you use? Honestly, I, know, I think it was like seven sites or something like that. What was your experience like training with uh, Mike Mensah? Did you Yeah, I mean, Mike Mensah was, uh, I read a lot of stuff when I started by Arthur Jones, uh, the guy that invented the Northwest machines. And uh, Mike Mentor about high intensity training, and uh, you know, uh, the, it just boils down to you know you need to send a certain uh, amount of stimulus to the muscle um, to give that, that signal for growth, and then you need to allow enough time for your body to recover for that growth to take place before you go to the gym again. And that varies from one person to another, depending on genetics, depending on whether they're using hormones or not, etc., etc. And uh, so I took, um, I took that information along with my own experience and I think my uh, training system was basically, it was almost like a, a merge between uh, the, the high intensity Mike Mentor training, Arthur Jones and more conventional bodybuilding. I, was, I, I always disagreed with, uh, with Arthur Jones and Mike Mentor in their limited use of exercises. You know they do maybe one exercise or two exercises per body part, which is great if you're, you know, you're the average person or you're, you're in a sport or something, you need muscle size and you need strength, but a bodybuilder is a different thing, you, you know, you need to train different aspects of the muscle, you can't get a complete deltoid for a bodybuilding competition if you're just doing pressing, you know, if you're a wrestler or a powerlifter or a football player, maybe that's great for them, but a bodybuilder, you need to work the side, you need to do laterals for the side, and same thing with quads, if I just did squats and leg presses, I'd have big legs, but I wouldn't have to sleep on the on the on the vast distance that I got from doing hack squats and so on. So I believed in a variety of exercises, uh, which which they didn't. So I differed a little bit. Um, so I read a lot of Mike Mansell stuff when I started, and I met him in Venice. I think it was uh, probably like '92. And we did a few workouts together, and uh, you know uh, I picked up some some stuff from him. I cut back my volume a little bit more. Not in a variety of exercises, but the number of sets I was doing. At that point, I was doing a couple of warm-up sets, and then one set to failure, and then I dropped the weight about 10% and do another set to failure. And he said, well, maybe that's just redundant. Once you've done that first set, and you, you've given the signal, doing it again is just like being a dead horse, and you're just making it harder for your body to recover because you're giving more than necessary. So I cut back uh, a little bit, and actually did get a little bit more growth out of that. 
Um, but I did probably three workouts with Mike Mensa and I respected his knowledge and everything, but of course Mike made the most out of it when he could as far as the workings on the main his own business and everything. So um, you know, people were saying that Mike was my trainer or he got me ready for a contest. That was never true because we did a few workouts and uh, picked some tips up from him uh, and that's as far as it goes and then there's a whole different area of like, getting ready for a bodybuilding contest and nutrition and everything that I mean, and had a conversation with Mike about that. You know, see it's from a different area. Um, you were talking about the variety of exercises. I mean, you're going for having one of the best backs. Um, what combination of exercises would you suggest? What kind of movements um, for a complete back? Well, you got to get. You want movements where you get a full range. Uh, you work in a full range and you get a good stretch. Um, pretty much, uh, I didn't do any wide grip exercises. A lot of people think wide grip chins, wide grip pull downs, you're getting a great stretch. You're not getting a great stretch because your, your lats uh, begin under your arm and circle lower down. So the further those two points are apart, the bigger stretch you're getting. So it makes sense that that is giving you a bigger stretch. And putting the biceps in a stronger position uh, with the reverse grip, um, because it, all your lat exercises bar Nautilus pull over machine, they're all limited by the strength of your bicep. So if you're doing a chin-up with a regular grip like that and you can't do any more chins, it's not because your lats have failed, it's because your biceps have failed, yeah? And your lats are still like, hey, I'm fine, you know? So uh, I did an Nautilus pullover machine, I started most of the workouts with that. Um, that, is, that takes your lats to 180 degrees with no bicep involvement. So I've totally slaughtered the lats. And then I go on to movements involving the bicep, and the lats are already pre-exhausted, so they're, they're going to go to play there on those exercises as well. Uh, the exercises mainly that I used were Nautilus pullover, uh, close grip pull down, either with a lat machine or uh, when the hammer machines came available, I started using the hammer machines around 93, uh, I think 94, something like that. I really like the close grip. Uh, I preferred that to the regular lat machine because the regular lat machine, you're pulling a straight line where the hammer was designed to swing out and then come back down, which is a natural movement. Uh, Sorry? Yeah, just because it's a reverse grip or a neutral grip, because it just puts your biceps in a mechanically stronger position. If you put your biceps out here, they're, they're very weak, so you're just going to fail and your lats are like along the right where they haven't been taxed fully. Um, and then rowing exercises, bent over barbell row, where I'd lift my body uh, up to 70 degrees. That puts the lats in a strong position, also protects your lower back. Uh, one arm dumbbell rows, uh, base pulley cable rows. Those are the main exercises I used. And then I'd finish with deadlifts from mid shins up, because uh, I'm not a power lift, I'm not interested in how much weight I can use. And the first third of the movement with the regular deadlift, that's all quads, glutes, hamstrings. Then your lower back kicks in. So I just wanted to keep it on the lower back. And uh, doing the deadlifts at the end in that fashion meant I didn't need to use huge bandages and put myself at risk of getting injured there. Um, so that was, that was the main back region. I'd probably do um, four exercises, uh, two or three sets each, with the last set being the whole. What about the hardest working body builders in business? Um, what mental techniques did you use to help push you through those last repetitions in the set that other people are Well, I always think you've got to have a goal, you know, in order to really push yourself. That, you know, you're not going to put yourself through discomfort, through pain. It's a natural thing if you're in discomfort and pain to like get away from it, right? That's a natural thing. So you have to know why you're doing that, why you're going through that, and what your goal is at the end. And that's uh, different for everybody. I think you need a, a short-term goal, and then you need a long-term goal. So your short-term goal may be, be for this month uh, that you want to put a quarter inch on your arms. You want to put. 20 pounds on the implant person. Whatever it is, they've got to be like reasonable achievable goals, you know, otherwise it's not going to make sense. So you need to have that goal and you need to know what the goal is when you go to the gym. And I used to like mentally prepare myself by uh, keeping a record and I'd go through my last workout. Okay, my last workout I did incline press 400 pounds for 6 reps. So today I need to get 7 reps or I need to get 8 reps or I need to put uh, five pounds on the bar. That's my goal for today. And I would sit down before I went to the gym, 
just take a little time to go through that and imagine myself in the gym. Imagine how the weight's going to feel and all that stuff. So I'm totally, when I go to the gym, I'm totally locked in. I know why I'm going there. I know which exercises I'm going to do in which order. I know what weights I'm going to use. I know what reps I'm looking for. Uh, and you've got to have that goal. If you're sitting at the bottom of a mountain and you hit Mount Everest and you say, right, I'm going to get to the top. You're like, no way I'm going to get to the top. I'm just going to get in right now, yeah? But if you say, I'm going to get to this little ledge here, and when you're there, then you look at the next one. I'm going to get there. And that's the way you do it. Eventually, one day, you might get to the top. You know? So that's what I did with the, with the training. And, you know, I had my monthly goals. Then I had my goal at the end of the year. You know, eventually it was Mr. Olympia. Before that was, you know, British Championship, whatever that is. And you've got to have your goals. You've got to know what you want to achieve at the end of the year, whether you want to be 10 pounds heavier or more muscular and lose body fat. You've got to break that down into monthly, you know, every little steps to make the journey. So you would say that the part, mental preparation is before you touch the base, and then once you Yeah, if, you, if you're going to the gym and you don't know what your goal is, you don't know what you're doing, when you get there, you're not going to achieve very much. You're actually going to come and say, oh, what shall I do today? I don't know. I'll, I'll do a bit of this. I'll do a bit of that. You're not going to get much out of it, you know? It's like putting a boat on the water and not having a, a route to follow. You're just going to swim around in circles and not get anywhere. 